how's everybody doing this afternoon? Good. I'm glad. Uh, four o'clock is a weird time uh, during conference championship week for the NFL. So, uh, you know, you miss the end of one game and then you miss the beginning, maybe middle, maybe end. Depends on how long I go, I guess. Uh, so we'll try to get through this. Uh, but one thing I wanted to say before we get started is this is not going to be your typical sermon. So if this is your very first time here and you're like, I want to try a new church. I want to check it out. I want to see what this guy's all about. Well, you'll learn some things today, but it um, it's not how we necessarily regularly do things. So withhold judgment. I always tell people anyway, if you're going to try a new church, go four times. Uh, because you, you can't possibly experience something good, something bad, something you like, something you dislike, uh, some mistake that people in the church have made uh, that they have an opportunity to maybe correct the next time. Like as a as a parent, if, if I'm taking my little kids, they're not little anymore, they're 26 and 23, but when they were little, I'd take them to church and, and uh, you know, hand them off. And it's like, gosh, that handoff wasn't very secure. Or I really loved the way that they did those things. So there are, there are things. So if this is your first time here, hopefully we see you next week as well. But I wanted to just set the table a little bit to say this is not it's not a traditional uh, sermon, and there's two reasons that this is not a traditional sermon. The first uh, reason is that I'm going to take a big portion of our time to tell you, well, to give you an, an announcement, and it's really an update more than an announcement. But then the second thing is um, I'm going to I'm going to tell a story, and it's a story that's largely about me. And I I think as pastors, like we need to be vulnerable, we need to do some of those things, but. I love the Bible way more than I love my own story. And I want to always tell the story that the Bible tells. And so a lot of times I'll pick a verse and we'll just sit in that verse for a long period of time. And we'll talk about what the words mean, what they meant when they were, they were written versus what they mean now and what different versions and translations say. And that's not what we're going to do today. But I also trust the power of story. Jesus trusted the power of story. He knew the power of story because he told story after story after story. If you don't believe me, go to Matthew chapter 7, chapter 8-ish and, and read. Just read those things, the, the stories that Jesus told. So I am going to tell you a story. It's a true story, but I want to start with an announcement. And they both are relevant to the scripture that we're ultimately going to be talking about today, just so you're aware. Uh, the first is, is an announcement that's really more of an update. Um, as I look around the room, I see most of you guys were here last spring when we went through a super difficult time in our church when Andrea Krause passed away, Pastor Jason's wife, who passed away uh, unexpectedly, and it was a shock to everybody, and none the least to Jason and to Smyra. It was a terribly difficult time. But in the face of that, we did have some things to celebrate. Uh, I told you then that I was really proud of how you came alongside of Jason and and uh, you, you, you called him, even when he didn't want to be called. Uh, you kept calling, which is what you have to do sometimes with somebody that you love. It doesn't want to pick up the phone, but you kept calling. You kept texting. Um, you kept sending food to his house. You probably still have some of that food. Like, there was a lot of food that was, was a lot of food. Um, one thing that I will say about Jason that I love about Jason is uh, some people would call it fiscally responsible. Uh, I, I say he's a cheapskate. Uh, he's very, very cheap. Frugal is the nice way to say it. And I, I don't know that I'll ever forget that at one point, uh, Will, where's Will? Will gave the announcement earlier. Uh, Will and, and I and Jason were talking, you know, in, in the wake of Andrea's passing. And Will and I had been talking about, like, how can we make sure that Jason is taken care of? And, um, you know, we're trying to organize meal trains and all this stuff. And uh, at some point, um, Will had said, hey, here's a screenshot of the, the food order that I just had sent to your house by Uber Eats. And it was just a sandwich. You remember this? It was just a sandwich. And uh, Jason's response wasn't, thank you so much for the sandwich. It was $27 for a sandwich? What are you doing? And keep in mind, this is like six weeks after I started here as the new senior pastor. So I'm still learning relationships with everybody and stuff, but I knew that I could trust Will immediately when he responded to Jason, oh, shut up. <laughs> I, I would gladly pay 10 times that amount to make sure that, that I know that you have some food in front of you because during times like this, sometimes we, we forget to eat. We forget that that's something that we need to do. So that happened last spring. And, uh, and you guys who were here then did an amazing job supporting him. And another way that I shared, and this is where the update comes in, 
that I shared with you is uh, we raised a pretty substantial amount of money for Jason. I shared with you at the time about $120,000. And when you look around the room, you go, that's an awful lot per person, right? That's just a lot of money for a small church to be able to raise for somebody. And um, we told you then, Jason was able to take some of that money and pay off his mortgage, pay off his house. He doesn't have a house payment that he has to worry about anymore. So it bought margin there. And uh, Samira was just about <laughs> ready to start her senior year of high school. So now there could be some conversations about what does college look like? Or, or you know, do we even want to stay here? Do we want to do something different? And, and really what we did is we, we bought Jason some margin. Okay. Um, and, and what I want you to know, if you don't know, is that before Jason was a pastor, Jason was a nurse. He was a cardiac nurse for a decade um, here in Spokane. And um, that's a profession that, that would have been really difficult for him to continue doing as Andrea's health declined. Um, you know, he'd already made a separation from that. He'd already stepped into pastoral ministry. He answered that call. And I know that we're all thankful that he did that. Um, but over the past few months, uh, Jason and I have been talking, and really the better part of the past year, we've been talking about what's next. What are you going to do with this war chest of money that you have set aside? Um, what, what does the future hold for you? And um, so what, one of the things that Jason and I have talked about that Jason has, has made clear to me and to a number of you is that Jason feels called back into the nursing profession. Um, and I want to just let you guys know, this is not me making an announcement that Jason is leaving, okay? Because that's not what's happening today. Uh, but it is something that may happen in the future. But it's going to be a little bit of time because Jason has been out of uh, the nursing profession for quite a while. And when he was in the nursing profession the last time, there were different requirements of people in that profession. So Jason has a, a two-year degree. He needs a four-year degree. Jason had a nursing license. He doesn't have one anymore. And so it's he's relicensing. He's working on that. So there's a process that's um, that, that, that's in play. And it's already been in in play for a period of time. When did you start the relicensing? December. So in December, he started doing this relicensing thing. And um, there were a couple things, there were a couple things that, that followed that, that I just, I wanted to, I wanted to make you aware. First, it's, it's an appropriate announcement for us today because we're going to be talking about the future. We're going to be talking about what we do when we hear news that we don't know what it looks like on the other end. Right? And we don't know. Jason doesn't know. I don't know. We don't know where that road is going to lead. We do know that we have some time. Uh, and so, again, I just want to make everybody aware. This is not a thing that's happening immediately. But it is something that, well, it's unknown. And, and we want to be praying for Jason and with Jason as we move into an unknown scenario. Uh, the second reason that I wanted to let you know about this today is that Jason's work schedule has changed. He's decided to go back to part-time. So if you were to stop by the office on a day where he normally would be here, and Jason is the quintessential administrative pastor because he, he basically lives here. Uh, he's here anytime something needs to be done and most times when it doesn't. Uh, he's, he's always here. Uh, this is a place that means an awful lot to him. So if you come in, for example, on a Wednesday, Jason's not going to be here on, on a Wednesday anymore unless there's some sort of special circumstance. And the reason is because he's, he's studying. like He's going back to school. It's not as easy as you thought it would be, is it? Like, it's hard work. And we want it to be hard work because one day Jason may be our nurse and we want him to do a good job. So study well. We're glad to give you the gift of, of some of that time. Uh, but more than all of those things, the, the most important reason that I told you this is I, I want you to know that this is something that wouldn't have been possible without a group of people following the call to be general. Because a church of... 60 to 70 people gathered together every week. It's not normal for them to raise $120,000 to be able to help somebody through a difficult time. So it's a, it's a big uh, result of, of our generosity here. You guys who gave, who, who gave, who continued to give in, in so many ways. And that's just the money that, that, uh, that we've recorded. That's just the money the church collected on Jason's behalf. I know, I know that there were people here that, Gave him money on his doorstep, you know. That gave him money in the cooler that was sitting on the on his uh, front porch. Um, so I, I'm telling you all of this because he, here's why. Because some of you are like, "Well, but wait a minute. I was generous, and now Jason is at some point in the future going to leave us and and go into this different search. Maybe I shouldn't be generous anymore." That's not what I want you to hear from this. 
what I want you to hear from this is that you were able to give Jason new life in the middle of a difficult situation. With your generosity, you were able to give him hold that, that maybe he didn't have and give him a chance to do something that had that money never came in. Well, who knows? Who knows? I think mean, God would have done what he wants to do, but we, we don't really know. So all I can say is thank you. And that's the update that I wanted to give you. Thank you. I know that it's an update that, uh, that can cause us a, a little bit of fear, but that's okay. It's an appropriate time to give that update because what have we been talking about for the entirety of 2023? Fear. So we all, nobody's afraid anymore, right? We've got it solved. We've solved the problem of fear in the, in the world and in our lives. We have been talking about fear. A few weeks ago when we started the series, we talked about fear of commitment. How many people struggle with the fear of commitment sometimes? Okay, good. Some of you are like, I don't know if I want to raise my hand. That's fear of commitment. Uh, but we also talked about how if you struggle with a, with a fear of commitment, it can cause you to miss out on experiences that, 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 you, that God really wants you to have. That God's like, I'm setting, I continue to put this thing in front of you so that you'll have this experience. And we're like, oh, but I'm afraid to do that. And it can be the same with relationships. Right, relationships that God's like, I'm putting this person in your life. I want you to get to know them. I want, I want there to be something there. Sometimes because of fear of commitment, we're like, ah, I don't know that I, I just can't do that right now. But we talked about the solution to a fear of commitment is no surprise, start committing to things. Start saying yes more often. And if that's tough for you, find people in your life that can help you when you say yes to something. Go to them and say, hey, I just, I just signed up for this thing and I don't really want to do it, but would you keep me accountable to doing this thing? Accountability partners are, are all about. Uh, inside of the church, one of the ways that we help hold each other accountable and, and help people through difficult things like fear of commitment is we get involved in small groups. Will and Dan, thank you, uh, both talked about small groups and you've heard from a number of people this month and the reason that you've heard from them is because we want everybody to be in a small group because Christian community in this version is awesome because we can do things as a larger group that we can't do as a, as a smaller group. We can worship like, like we can with, with lights and sound systems and projectors and things that aren't really terribly important to worship, but I really love them. When I spent 15 years as a, as a worship pastor and more than that as a worship leader, so like I, I like being in those in those circles. I like, I like experiencing some of that stuff, but we can worship apart from that. And so sometimes maybe in your small groups, there, there's an, kind of an intimate form of worship that may happen. But I know that conversations that don't happen here can happen there. And some of the things that come up in those conversations are, hey, I'm struggling with a fear of commitment. Can, can you help me through this? So one great step is to, to step into a small group. Just make a commitment. And if that's you, I'm going to point you towards Will. He's going to be back at the table uh, afterwards. I, we're not going to talk as often. We are still going to talk about small groups, but we're not going to be talking about them as often as we have been because this is a new thing. It's a relaunch for us. So we've been talking about them since September, October, pretty regularly. And for the month of January, a bunch to let you know that all of our small groups are open and you can go and you can test them out and you can try them out. Um, it's not that they're going to be closed from this point forward. It's not that you won't still be able to come and join a, a small group. You just may not hear about the opportunity as much uh, from, from this point on. And I know that for some people, some of the commitment, the fear of commitment that we struggle with is because we don't want to be uh, that new person who heads in in the middle of something. So if you don't want to be the new person who heads in in the middle of something, start now. Because in the month of February, our small groups, while they're going to do the things that they do. They each have kind of their own lane, their own flavor, their own brand for, for how, they, how they meet and what they do when they get together. Uh, I'm going to be asking the small groups to, to add something to it, and it's supplemental to what we're doing on Sundays. So our next series is called The Basics, and we're going to be talking about some of the foundational elements of Christianity, what it means to be a Christian. And I think this is, as a mature Christian, you go, well, but I already know the basics. And you go, yeah, but we can always do the basics better. We, we can always do the basics better. So we're going to 
Go back to basics. We're going to talk about some of those things. And my hope is that each week in your small groups, you'll be able to have a conversation that's that's based uh, at least in, in small part. I don't want to dictate all of that time, but in small part around the topic that we're navigating together as a church. But what I think that does is it, it catalyzes us together. Because now when we're together, we're talking about something. And when we're in smaller communities, we're talking about something. And when you get into even smaller communities with, with discipleship relationships, mentoring, and, and just being involved one-on-one, like th- those things are at the, the forefront of your, your thoughts. And so we talk about some of those things. So that's, that's where we're going. Now, all that to say, we've talked about fear of commitment, no excuses. Let's make commitments. The ones that we know we should in small group is one of those. Two weeks ago, we talked about the fear of failure. And we talked about how important it is to recognize that there's a difference between failing at something and branding yourself a failure. How many are human in the room? I'm looking for every hand just to make sure. We're all going to make mistakes because we're all human. We're, we're all going to screw up sometimes. We're all going to fail. How many belong to, to Christ? More hands. Wow. <laughs> we're excited about that, and that's, that's good. We're all human. We're all going to make mistakes. And if we belong to Christ, we aren't failures. Even if we sin, even if we screw up, we may fail at something, but God doesn't think of us as a failure. We're only a failure when we quit. We're only a failure when we stop, especially when we're talking about righteousness. We're pursuing righteousness. We'll never never get to the point of perfection, not this side of heaven. This is not something that that happens. We're always going to have the potential to struggle with something. But thankfully, we have a God who says, and even though you may mess up, even though you you may make mistakes, even though you screw up, I still love you. Even though you may fail, you are not a failure. So failure is not something that we need to be afraid of. Last week, we talked about the fear of rejection. And I shared a quote from a, an author, a pastor that I really like from the Washington, D.C. area. His name's Mark Batterson. And I'll just summarize the, the quote that I gave you. Uh, he said um, that to combat any fear, failure, commitment, rejection, any other thing, we first need to get comfortable with the fact that those things are going to happen sometimes. And second, we need to work to build up an immunity to those things. And I love that he used that word immunity because it means that in small doses, we're building up a tolerance. Now, that doesn't mean we get really comfortable with failure or rejection or commitment, but it does mean when those things inevitably show up, the pressure that comes with Fear of those things is a lesson. So uh, we've talked about fear of rejection. We've talked about fear of failure. We've talked about fear of commitment. And today, today we're going to talk about what for me is the most difficult, the most oppressive of all of these fears. It's It's the toughest one for me to overcome. And I don't know why I'm just wired in such a way where I tend to, I tend to fixate on this one. It's really, really really hard for me not to fall prey to this fear. The fear that we're talking about today is fear of the unknown. I'm going to share a story that's, uh, that's going to tell you a little bit about where I've been for the past two months, because uh, the past two months have been some of the scariest months of my life. Um, and I'll give you some insight into that. Uh, but before I do, I just want to read a passage of scripture from, from Matthew 6. And the reason that I want to read this is because we're not studying this scripture today, but I think as we're thinking about fear and how fear affects us, this is a great passage for us to, to go to, to read, to constantly be reminded of, of where our focus should be in the, in the face of fear of any sort. So this uh, passage comes from Matthew 6, uh, beginning in verse 25. These are the words of Jesus, by the way. Therefore, I tell you, Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, uh, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They don't labor or spin, yet I tell you, 
that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. That is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow, which is thrown into the fire. Uh, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the, the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Let's pray. God, I pray that, uh, that you give me the right words to say today. And I pray that even if I don't say the, those words, God, that people would hear what they need to hear. I pray that when we leave this place, God, we'll have a healthier understanding of what we should put our, our faith into and how to distance ourselves from fear, especially as we talk about fear of the unknown. In Jesus' name, amen. It's easy to get distracted by things that we don't know, isn't it? Like if you know something and then there's something else you want to know and you don't know it, it can be easy to, to focus on that thing. It can be easy to think about that thing. And, and why is that? Well, it's because we want to know. <laughs> and if we didn't want to know, if there was something that existed out there that, that we had no thoughts about, then it wouldn't frighten us. But when we think about things and we say, well, I don't know what's coming next, we have a tendency as a species to imagine all of the bad ways that can go. Anyone, anyone do that sometimes? We, we fill in the gaps. Now, sometimes we fill in the gaps with positive things, with good things, with hopeful things. But most people, most of the time, we get stuck in some of the bad. And I'm one of those people. And the crazy thing is, most of the time, those things have little to, to maybe absolutely zero chance of happening. But I still give them the same space in my mind as I do the healthy things. And usually the negative things outnumber the healthy things. So I'm putting a, an inordinate amount of thought into the negative. But it may not be something that can even happen at all. And that's not to say that we should never think about negative things. I, I do think that we should think about worst case scenarios. The Bible tells us to be good stewards of our lives, not just our money. Jesus used money to say, hey, this is what stewardship looks like. But the point was that we would learn how to handle our money. We would learn how to handle our effort that we spend. We would learn how to handle our, our time, that we would look at all that God has blessed us with and given, given us, and that we would, we would take care of those things. But he also tells us in all of those things that we need to be people who count the cost. We, we do need to think about the risks sometimes. So I'm not saying that we all should be pie in the sky, like only thinking positive all the time, like, because we do need to think, we do need to think realistically about some of these things, some of the bad things, but we, we need to be careful not to fixate on those things, because when we fixate on the negative, that can lead to fear. And we don't want to be afraid, because God tells us that we shouldn't be afraid. So I want to tell you about um, the past couple of months for me and why I've been afraid. And it started um, on, on December 3rd. I remember the day. Uh, it was a Saturday morning, and my family was gathered together, my wife Becky and I, my, my sons, Timothy and Ethan, um, Timothy's wife, my daughter-in-law, uh, Jessica. And then my soon-to-be daughter-in-law, Autumn, uh, because my youngest is engaged. Um, we were all over at our house, and we were decorating for, for Christmas. And uh, when we gather, we eat. Right? It's just something that we do. I love to eat, as you can tell. I like food. So we're eating, and in the middle of breakfast, I had this weird thing happen. Uh, I, I went to swallow my food, and it got stuck. It got stuck in my throat. And I don't mean like... I don't mean like it got stuck where I needed to have the Heimlich maneuver or something. Like nobody at the table knew that that food was stuck in my throat. And, and I very quickly, quickly was able to kind of clear, clear it out. Um, but it, it was weird, right? It, it, was, it was a scary thing. So then I took a couple more bites. I kept, you know, took a big drink of water or juice or whatever we had for breakfast. Um, but a few bites later, I had the same thing happen. This food just got, it got stuck in, in my throat. Um, so I did what uh, any rational person would do. 
I had a panic attack, a complete and utter panic attack because I started thinking about like, what if I can never eat food again? That would be, that would suck. I don't want, I don't want that. I want to keep eating. And, but, but I, I did, I, I, I got, I got physically sick. Anyone ever have an experience that made them physically sick because of anxiety? What a panic attack is like. I've had one or two in my whole life. But in that moment, I can look back now and go, I was having a panic attack. I turned to my wife, Becky, she was sitting on my left. And I said, hey, I'm not feeling very good. So I'm going to go lay down for a little bit. And she was like, yeah, you look, you look pretty pale and sweatier than normal. I'm a pretty sweaty guy. So, and so I went and I laid down in our bedroom and I, I uh, immediately made the decision not to Google anything. Because if you ever Google a symptom, like WebMD will tell you it's terminal cancer. It's just the way that it is. So I went, okay, I'm not going to do that because I have a tendency to be a little bit of a hypochondriac anyway, right? Because I fixate on the bad things. I fill in the gaps with bad things. And so went to my room, prayed, tried to take my mind off of it, tried to, tried to calm down a little bit. And it was probably 20 or 30 minutes later, I went, okay, this is all in your head. It, it's ridiculous. Nothing, nothing wrong. So, uh, you know, collected myself, washed my face, went into, uh, went back into the, to the dining room. I think we were decorating by, by that point, but I thought, well, I'm going to go back and eat food because there's nothing wrong with me. And uh, guess what happened when I took the first bite? I didn't swallow it. So we decorated. I told Becky later, I said, yeah, really, when I went to lay down, I was, I was having this, this weird thing happen. And she's like, weird, but she knows I'm a hypochondriac. And so she's like, just, you know, just ignore it, try to get over it. But I, I couldn't get over it. Uh, that was, was, like I said, Saturday, December 3rd. December 4th, I came here, still having a difficult time eating. I don't think I probably ate anything uh, the rest of that day and into the next because I was so just afraid. Um, I, uh, that Sunday, I was standing in the back like I often do when I'm not on the worship team. And I was getting ready to come up and preach. And I noticed that, uh, that my left arm just had a really weird feeling. Like it wasn't, it wasn't numb. It wasn't asleep. It was just, it was, there was a strange sensation. And then I started thinking about just, you know, the, the, the whole choking thing and, and the arm and this like neurological kind of thing. And I just got really scared, but I'm like, worship's coming to an end. I gotta, I gotta get on stage. So I came on stage and I, and I preached and uh, got done and I, and I went home and I told my wife what had happened. And um, she said, you know, you probably maybe should think about making a doctor's appointment or something. And I said, yeah, um, I should. Okay. So I woke up the next morning on Monday and on uh, Monday, my left arm was pretty much completely numb. My right arm now was numb and my left arm was tremoring and I couldn't get it to stop. Um, and what I didn't tell you is that a few days later on December 7th, it was going to be my 45th birthday. So I started thinking about all of the ways that I could die before Wednesday uh, that were likely going to happen, that I wouldn't be able to celebrate my birthday, that I wouldn't be able to celebrate break Christmas a few weeks later, that I wouldn't be there to, to officiate my, my son's wedding the, the, this coming September. And I just, I, I panicked. And so I, I called my doctor and said, I need to see somebody. And thankfully they had an appointment the next day. Um, but I went to bed that night. I had another really weird experience that night where um, if you've ever been so cold that you physically cannot stop shaking, or if you've ever had a fever so bad that you're, you know, your body just kind of collapses in on itself, that was happening to me all night long. Um, and in the morning when I woke up, both of my arms were tremoring and my legs were tremoring. And I was just, it was a really, it was a strange um, few days, really few months, if I'm being honest. Uh, so I went in to see my doctor the next day and I'm so thankful for my doctor. I, I called to make a doctor's appointment last summer and uh, called my doctor's office. I'm like, I need to see, you know, doctor so-and-so. And they're like, oh, he died okay, well, I need a, I guess I need a new doctor. And they're like, oh, well, we're not seeing any new patients. And I'm like, okay, so now I'm on this hunt for anybody have to look for a new doctor in the past year or so. It's tough to find a new doctor sometimes, but I was able to find one and I, I recognized his last name. It was an uncommon last name. And I, I looked him up and I realized that his dad is a friend of mine. He's a pastor of a church in town, has been a pastor in town since the mid nineties, uh, a well-known pastor. And I thought, I'm gonna go see this guy. <laughs> Like, cause he loves Jesus. He's been a missionary. Like, it's very obvious when I read his bio that he's, that he's still uh, walking with the Lord while he's working inside of medicine. And so um, I made an appointment to see him for something else this summer. So I started a relationship with him. Well, I went back to him and I sat down. His name's Daniel. And I said, I'm, Daniel, I'm just, 
I'm scared. I'm scared that some horrible neurological condition is attacking my body and is making all of these things happen. I, I don't want to Google it. I don't want to WebMD it. I don't, I don't know what to do. He said, well, you came to the right place because I do. Uh, and he said, I'm going to order a, a bunch of tests for you. But before I do, can I pray for you? And I don't know if you know this, but doctors, uh, I have a friend who's a, who, who just went through this miraculous curing of cancer. He had cancer and then he went in to have surgery for the cancer and then the cancer was just gone. Um, uh, and and uh, I have been talking to him an awful lot through this, but he, he said, you know how your doctor prayed for you? I said, yeah. And he goes, man, that's crazy because doctors do not deal in hope. Doctors deal in, in rationality and what they can see. And they don't want to give you hope for something that, that they may not be able to deliver on the promise of. And so he said, you got a great doctor. Stick with this doctor. And, and my doctor prayed for me. Um, and then uh, he ordered blood work. He ordered a chest x-ray. He ordered a thyroid workup. He ordered a, an ENT workup. I had my, my, my nasal passages down my throat scope twice. I do not recommend it uh, first time or the second time. Um, just a bunch of things. I had x-rays and blood work and I had a, an MRI. I, ha- I still have things because of the way the medical system is right now, just backed up. I, I still need to see a neurologist, but I'm having har- a hard time getting in to one. Um, in two weeks, I have a swallowing study where you, you, know, you drink barium and then they x-ray and they feed you a bunch of food to see if they can get you to choke. I don't know if they have just buckets around just in case, but uh, I've got that coming up and I've been told that the results of that probably will move me into speech therapy if, if I need it because speech therapy is the gold standard for, for throat, for musculature inside of your neck. And so I've learned an awful lot in all of this. And we've, we've spent time kind of covering every angle that this thing um, could be. And I'm happy to report that as of right now, everything is okay. Like, no test has revealed um, what, what could have caused any of this stuff. But I still do continue to have symptoms. Uh, not all of the symptoms. And my wife and I, one night, she started, because I'm not Googling anything, but she looked up some things and said, you know, some of these symptoms that you're, you're describing, they can be caused by anxiety. Have you talked to our, our counselor about it? I've been seeing the same counselor for 10 years and uh, we see him together now also, but I started as my counselor. And so I texted him the night that I got done with my doctor's appointment. And I said, Hey, I don't have a diagnosis yet, but this could be something potentially life altering. Could, could we talk? And he called me that night. He's a professor at Gonzaga in addition to being a, a, a therapist. And he called me that night at like 10 PM. And we talked for half an hour on the phone and we've been meeting weekly since. And he, he affirmed what my wife had found, which is anxiety can do crazy stuff. Anxiety can cause an awful lot of, of things to happen in, inside of your body. So I'm thankful for my doctor. I'm thankful for him. But if I'm being really honest with you, it's been a pretty unsettling, fear-filled eight weeks. Made my birthday pretty difficult. Made Christmas and the new year uh, pretty difficult. It's made some of my conversations with some of you uh, pretty difficult because I want to be vulnerable and honest as much as I possibly can. But um, sometimes it's just not appropriate. I, it's hard to tell somebody that I'm going through a major health thing when I don't even know if it's a major health thing. My, my, my brain just fills in the gaps and thinks about the negative stuff. But I, I, wanted to, I wanted to share some of that with you to let you know first that I do tend to be a person who fixates. So maybe just always say nice things to me uh, so I can think about those. Um, I, I, I catastrophize. I think about the worst possible situation and this this season has, has caused me to, uh, to think about an awful lot of really scary things, and it's not over yet. So I would, I would ask humbly that you would be praying for me. Um, I know that many of you have been. I've confided in some of you with this, and as, as I've gotten some more um, information, I've told more and more people, and I didn't want it to seem like that I was picking favorites and only sharing with certain people, right? Like if you heard from somebody that wasn't me, and you thought we had a close relationship, and you go, wow, what? Why didn't, he t- why didn't he tell me, right? But then you don't want to, you don't want to come to me with that because you know I fixate on things and no, you can always come to me with that stuff. Uh, but th- the point is, it's it's been a scary time. Um, there've there've been some good, there've been some bad. Um, but it's really revealed to me a little bit more about how important it is that we work hard to reject a fear of the unknown. 
fear of the unknown, um, it, it's a fear, much like rejection last week, that's focused on something kind of imaginary, something uh, speculative. It's focused on something that, that isn't guaranteed. It may not even be possible. And it's potentially blatantly an untrue thing. Other than the fear of God, which the Bible tells us, to have fear in any other form is a liar. Part of the reason that we entered into this series when we did is because in the month of January and New Year's, people want to do new things, new goals, New Year's resolutions. And sometimes we can't do those things because of fear. So we said, let's, let's try to learn how to combat some of these fears. But this is one of the most difficult ones to combat. Because it includes, in those gaps between what we know, it includes everything that we don't. And so we just, we start making things up. And we start living in, in that place. And, and one of the things that I learned through this is that a fear of the unknown, it's really just a fear of the future. And that might not be mind-blowing to you, but think about it in this context. Are we ever disappointed when somebody can't tell us the future? Why would we be? Why would we be upset with somebody that can't tell us the future? None of us know the future. Fortune tellers are not a real thing outside of spirituality and evil, right? And, and prophecy. Like there's some good things too. But those things are largely not things that we interact with on a regular basis. If I, if I have a friend and I say, hey, can you tell me about this part of my life in the future? And they can't. Am I going to be upset when they don't? Well, of course not. So why in the world would I put the same expectation on myself? Why don't I expect you to know my future, but why do I expect me to? When the Bible's pretty clear that even Jesus didn't know some of the things that were going to happen. In Matthew uh, chapter 24, in verse 36, he's talking about when he returns to, to collect his people. And he, again, these are the words of Jesus, and he's speaking to the disciples. He says, but about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor who? The son. Who's the son? Jesus. He's talking about himself. But only the father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the son of man. And then he goes on to describe ju just how little we'll know about when it's actually going to happen. He says, for in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking. Marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Up to the day Noah entered the ark. What happened on the day Noah entered the ark? It rained. Who lived? Noah. <laughs> Seven other people. Some animals that he brought with him. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other will be left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. And this next couple of verses I think is of, of great importance to us as we learn to combat the, the fear of the unknown. In verse 43, it says, but understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch. and and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the son of man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. He didn't know. We don't know. There are things that Jesus doesn't know. And what he's not saying here is that we should just expect every horrible thing to happen all the time and fixate on those things. He, he said if the if the, the, the owner of the house knew the thief was coming, he didn't say he'd dedicate every moment of his life to, to, to imagining that that thief is coming and to combating that thief in that moment. No, he said he would prepare, prepare as if he's certain that that thing would come true. So somebody who's certain that a thief is coming is going to prepare in a certain way. So what God is saying here for us, what Christ is saying is that you know he's coming back. You, if you believe the Bible to be true, you know he's coming back. You don't know how, you don't know when, but you're certain that he's coming. 
So act like it's today. Do what you're supposed to do today. Focus on what you should be doing today. And don't get distracted by focusing on imaginary things that may or may not come to pass in the future. Focus on the seriousness of the only thing that we can be certain of. And we believe the Bible to be true means we can be certain that when Jesus returns, he's taking his children back with him. And it's not a happy day for everyone else. That when Jesus comes, he comes with with love. But he also comes with judgment. When he comes, he comes with forgiveness and, and grace. It's also punishment. And there's a line of demarcation here, and none of us are on the correct side of that line. Unless we belong to Jesus. How do we overcome a fear of commitment? Well, we, we commit. We, we make commitments. How do we overcome a fear of failure? We, we get used to failing. And we understand that, that that is not how God defines a failure. How do we overcome rejection? Well, we trust enough in who God is that we grow immune to it because we know that we are accepted by God. How do we overcome a fear of the unknown? We don't focus on what we don't know. We focus on what we do know. And what do we know? It's coming back. God loves us. He has a plan for us. His plans are good. And nothing that I could seek out in this world can ever compare to the plan that God has for me. I think that that's a super important thing for us to remember is that we may pursue whatever version of greatness or, or wealth, or, or stability. We, if you think about um, the person that you know that, ha- just think real quick, probably somebody will come into your mind. Who's the person, don't say them out loud, right? I don't want to embarrass anybody. Who's the person that you know that has the greatest marriage you've ever seen in your life? Think of somebody? Most of us probably thought of somebody and then went, well, I don't know, maybe. I've seen them fight before. It's okay, you can fight and still have a, Great marriage. My wife and I do it all the time. I'm just joking. We actually don't fight that much. Right? Think about, um, think about the family that has the, the best possible kids. Like you love your kids, but if your kids were a little more like those kids, you'd love them a little bit more. I know that's a horrible thing to say. Th- think about the, the person that you know. Maybe it's a famous person. who ha- Maybe it's just somebody you know who has uh, the lifestyle that you want the most money that you possibly could ever possess. Think about opulence and extravagance to whatever degree in whatever circumstance. Now imagine that you could work hard and earn that for yourself. Pretty cool, right? I think in some ways we we, we can do that. But imagine we do that, but as a consequence for that, we don't get to call ourselves children of God. Is that a trade-off that any of us want to make? The hard part about that is that means that sometimes while we're here, some of the things that we're afraid of, these unknown things that exist in the future, those uncomfortable things that we don't really want to go through, sometimes we're going to. Sometimes we're going to experience those things. Tell you what, it's a whole lot better of a situation to experience those things if you do it with Christ. We all can agree that chasing after all of those things, yet giving up our salvation as a result isn't something that we'd want to do. Then we need to be people who are willing to, even when we look at the future, we think about the future, and it causes us to be a little bit afraid because of the uncomfortable nature of what lies ahead. We need to be willing to go, but I have Jesus, which makes this version of my future better than the one that I would plan out for myself, the one that I would seek after. That's a difficult thing for me sometimes because I want Jesus, but I don't always want what Jesus wants for me, especially when those things are uncomfortable. It caused me to make 
commitments that I don't want to make. Cause me to, to fail in ways that I don't want to fail. To cause me to extend myself to the place where I get rejected in a way that I don't want to be rejected. And especially when I think about my future. I want the future that I want. But I need to be somebody who wants the future that Christ wants for me. There's a passage of scripture in Matthew 10, 26. Again, this is, uh, these are the words of, of Jesus. And I, I think this passage helps, it helps focus us on what we should be focused on during those times when we are afraid. Hopefully it, it does for you like it has for me. And so do, he says, so do not be afraid of them. He's speaking about people and circumstances uh, in the world apart from righteousness and a pursuit of Christ. Do not be afraid of them, those people, those things, for there's nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who could destroy both the soul and body in hell. Fear God. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside of your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So do not be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. No fear for those people who don't have to experience the condemnation that comes with being separate from Christ. There's no fear for us. Fear of commitment, of failure, of, of rejection, of, of the unknown. It's not something that we have to fear because we know that God loves us, that he's planning good things for us, that he's rescuing us, that he's already done the work that's required that we would be able to experience forgiveness. And the only thing that we need to do is trust in him. Trust. It starts so small. So if you're in a place tonight where you're struggling with any of these fears or any other thing that you can think about that, that would cause you to be afraid, the solution is trust. The solution is, solution is, is faith. The solution is a, an increase in our belief of who God is, what he's doing, what he's done, and what he's capable of. So as we close in prayer tonight, I, I want to take a moment. Let's just bow our heads. Close your eyes. Like I said, I want to do some things a little bit differently. If you, if you are struggling with fear in some way right now, would you just put your hand up? Okay, thank you. God, I pray that your spirit would permeate this place in a way that it casts out fear. As I, as I see those, those hands rise up and I think that half the people are bold enough to admit. That half the people in this room are so afraid that they would raise their hand and say, I'm afraid struggling with something. God, we, we know that the only solution to fear is for us to lean more fully into who you are. So God, for every hand that went up, I, play, I pray a special prayer of blessing upon every one of those people, me included, God. I want your blessing too. Remove fear from my mind, from my heart, from my life. God, I pray for every person here, whether they raise their hand or not, that we would be able to be bolder followers of you. That we would be filled with your Holy Spirit in a, in a way that inspires others to, to run away from their own fears, God, and to run towards you instead. God, we know that in this life, there will be struggle. There will be pain. There will be things that have the potential for causing us 
fear. But God, may we realize that if we have you in our lives, we have no reason to fear. So God, let us find more of you. Make us the people who seek you. And God, we pray that you bind up the spirit of fear. Bind it up and release people from the bondages that come from those fears. We know that you can do it. So God, we ask you to do it. God, we love you. I'm thankful for City Church and that it's a safe place. God, we ask that you continue to increase uh, our presence, God, in, the, in the, the community so that they would be able to see that this is a safe place where they can go, where they can bring their fears and they can find somebody who can shoulder them with them, who can help carry those burdens. And ultimately, we can just leave them outside because we don't need them anymore. God, may we find you more fully every day. Jesus' name. Amen.